<clears throat> Thank you, Steve. That is a great song, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Not for me, but for the glory of God. Thank you. I guess I uh, kind of was looking as I was sitting down there, and I noticed that uh, my table is gone, and I guess the older you get, the more they think maybe I need a stool to sit on rather than a table to lay things on. I don't know, but <laughs> couldn't find my table. Well, thank, thank you for putting the stool there. So, well, I hope y'all have uh, prepared for Christmas and getting ready for a, a nice Christmas as we celebrate the birth of our Lord. I just want to tell you, don't ever stop believing in Santa Claus, though, because when you do, you stop getting the big, nice gifts and you start getting underwear. So don't stop believing in Santa Claus, okay? Um, you know, when I mention Mona Lisa, or I mentioned the scream and impression sunrise, uh, what comes to your mind? Anything come to your mind when I mention those articles? Um, they're all famous paintings. I'm sure some of you were thinking about that and you knew that, and if you did, you were correct. But they actually have a couple other things in common. The first is that they're all considered to be tremendously valuable, of course. And uh, you probably uh, know that, well, maybe you don't, that uh, some call them just treasures of art, obviously. The, the second thing is that the originals were all at some time stolen. The originals all at some time were stolen. That's something they have in common. You know, the Mona Lisa was painted by Leonardo da Vinci in the 16th century. Uh, and in 1911, a museum worker walked out of the Louvre uh, with the Mona Lisa under a smock, and he later expressed that he thought that the masterpiece belonged in Italy instead of France. Two years later, uh, the thief was caught trying to sell the painting. Now, the screen by Edvard Munch was painted in the early 1900s, and in 2004, the, the scream was ripped off of a museum wall uh, by armed robbers. Unfortunately, it was recovered and restored. Now, the Impression Sunrise was painted by Claude Monet in the late 1800s. And in 1985, armed robbers stormed the Marmouton uh, Museum in Paris, and, and they took the painting. So the painting was recovered by French police about five years later. Now you might be asking yourself, why would I be talking about uh, treasured paintings uh, here at Christmas time? What does it have to do with, uh, with Christmas? Well, as we are closing in on Christmas, I wanted to remind you of what an amazing and, and precious treasure the first Christmas brought uh, to each one of us. You know, as our planning and, and preparation and commitments uh, reach a, a fevered pitch, and maybe some of you are feeling that about now in these last few days before the holiday, I, I don't want the real treasure of Christmas to be stolen from underneath you. You know, the point of Christmas, after all, is that God came to dwell with us so that we could dwell with him forever. He came to live with us so that we could live with him forever. And as John reminds us in the first chapter of his gospel, verses 1 through, uh, actually verses 1 and 14, the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, made his dwelling among us. And of course, that is Jesus Christ, the word, with God from the very uh, beginning. And so when you think of the enormity of God and the, the complexity of his creation uh, and the majesty of his glory, this effort for our salvation really is beyond comprehension. We just cannot imagine all that God has in store for those who believe. And we see evidence of it each and every day as he works uh, in and through our lives and praise God for that. But we just cannot imagine uh, the enormity of it all. So why would God go to such lengths to restore us to himself? You know, the answer, of course, is found in his nature. 
And of course, you can see by the little clip there what I'm talking about when I say in his uh, nature. It's found in, in the one word God uses to describe himself in 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 8, that God is love. Good old Charlie Brown. God is love. So with Christmas uh, nearly upon us, as we begin to wrap up our little uh, Christmas sermon series, The Cast of Christmas, I wanted to help us to preserve and protect the real treasure and meaning of the holiday. That's what it's all about. And we're going to do that by looking at the account of the Magi, the account of the Magi. So far in our series, we've looked at the response of the, of the prophets. We've looked at the shepherds. We've looked at the, the angels. And so this morning in this short account in scripture, Matthew chapter two, we center our attention on the Magi's worship of Jesus Christ, our Lord. However, we see three very different responses uh, to this wonderful event. Now, King Herod, the teachers of the law, and the Magi will take a different approach to the event of Jesus' birth. So before we begin at the, and take a look at these different responses, uh, let us get the actual picture that the Bible paints. And you're gonna find that in Matthew uh, chapter two, if you'd please turn there in your scriptures with me. And if you don't have your written word with you today, maybe you can use a Bible app on your iPhone or iPad. Uh, those are always very helpful. Uh, but it's good to have the written word as well. I don't know about you, but I like to uh, make notes in, in my Bible on the, on the side, side lines and so on. But, uh, and maybe you don't do that. Maybe you don't like to write in your Bible, but it's always good to have the written word. But let's see what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 12, as we take a look at all three of these reactions to the amazing events at Christmas. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, uh, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. In other words, when King Herod is not happy, there ain't nobody happy, okay? So the, all of Jerusalem was disturbed with him. Uh, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. And it begins in verse 6. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. So after they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, Verse 11, did you hear that? On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Won't you pray with me, please? Father God, we pray that... Uh, you would open our ears to hear your word this morning. And, and Father, that we would be able to apply your word to our lives because the scripture says that as you send your word, it will not return void, that it will accomplish much and accomplish what, uh, what you have sent it for. And so, Father, speak to us through your word this morning, we pray in Christ's name, amen. You've heard the account of the, of the Magi, 
or the wise men, many times, I, I'm sure, uh, especially around Christmas time. But the image in your mind may not line up exactly with the scriptures. You know, despite what many of us sing every year, we three kings of Orient are, uh, you'll notice according to our text, the Magi most likely were not kings and that the Bible doesn't say how many of them there were. And so they are magi or wise men, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they were kings. They could have been, but not necessarily. The Expositor's Bible commentary tells us that in later centuries, uh, down to New Testament times, the term magi loosely covered a wide variety of men, men that were interested in dreams, men that were interested in astrology magic, and books thought to contain mysterious references to the future and the like. Those are the kind of books the Magi's studied. So instead of kings, uh, more than likely, scholars believe that they were actually scholars and astrologers who most likely had some working knowledge and belief in the Hebrew scriptures. Why wouldn't they? They were very knowledgeable uh, men. So perhaps they were connected with the Hebrews uh, who were deported to or maybe lived in uh, the East. Now the tradition that three were, uh, they, uh, that there were in fact three of them uh, probably comes from the fact that there were three gifts that were given uh, to Jesus. But it's possible that each gift came from a number of the Magi. Now, I don't want you to get all messed up with all of that stuff, you know, because a lot of it, uh, you know, while we want to trust God's word and scripture, but if you read that passage once again that we read this morning, you, you can easily see what, what uh, much of what I'm saying to you is exactly right uh, from the scripture. And so, you know, the main thing is don't stop believing in Santa Claus because you don't want to start getting that underwear as a, your, your gifts, right? Uh, but also, if you don't believe in Santa, you're a rebel without a clause, You know, some people tell me they like my stupid jokes. So, so occasionally I have to come up with a fairly stupid joke. I, I'll just tell you another one. Why couldn't Frosty ever get along with his wife? Anyone know? Why couldn't Frosty ever get along with his wife? Because she was a frosted flake. That's why. Okay, I'm, I'm hearing just a little bit. What did Adam say to his wife on the day before Christmas? It's Christmas Eve. I thought that was the dumbest one. It got the most laughs. <laughs> but you know, we don't know where uh, the Magi came from, except that it was to the east. We, we do know that. And perhaps it was as far away as Babylon, as you can see on the map. Now, we don't know what the star was exactly. I mean, there's been all kinds of speculation on that. Uh, some suggest it could have been a sign in the heavens like the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn that took place around uh, 7 BC. Some think it was a comet or a supernova. Others believe it was a purely supernatural event. And I want to tell you, that's kind of where I fall. I, I believe it was a supernatural event, like the pillar of fire or cloud that led the Israelites through the desert. In the, uh, through the Exodus, you recall that. So that's what I believe, a supernatural event from God placed that star in the sky at the right time in the right place. You know, the most amazing thing about the Magi, though, is that in this short account in Matthew, these non-Jewish foreigners with questionable religious practices who were gazing at the stars... And this is what I want you to hear this morning. They were the ones who responded, the only ones who responded approximately, uh, appropriately to the birth of Jesus Christ. Don't you find that amazing? Now, we know how the shepherds responded a year or two earlier, but in this account, it was the Magi. Now, why do I say the shepherds a year or two earlier? Well, <laughs> Once again, I don't want to upset anybody about your traditional Christmas here, 
but the Magi probably came a year or two later than the shepherds. In other words, they were not part of the nativity scene, okay? And read that. Where did they go? They didn't go to the stable. Where did they go? The scripture says it. They went to the house. They went to the house. I mean, it would have taken them a long time to travel from uh, Babylon all the way over to uh, Israel. So uh, are we like the Magi, really, though, focusing on our worship and adoration and gifts for the king as we should or are we so familiar with the story that our wonder has been lost or stolen? You know, this serves as a stark reminder for those who've, who are in the church and consider ourselves to be uh, followers of Jesus. I mean, could it be that the Christmas story has become so familiar to us that it really doesn't hold the awe that it did at one time? Could it be the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ is not quite what it was from the very beginning, even though you were a young Christian at time? But can you remember the days that you were just super excited about coming to the Lord and, and what all that meant? You know, we might expect those outside the faith to miss the real meaning of Christmas, but will we make certain our hearts stay focused on what this holiday really means? That's the question. Now, a little later, we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into the Magi's response, but before we do, let's consider another response. And in doing so, we'll look at verses four and five. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, that being Herod, called them together, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. You know, after encountering the Magi, Herod called the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He called them together and asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Now they shared the answer by quoting the prophet Micah, who prophesied some 700 years before Jesus was born, who pointed to Bethlehem. That's where Jesus was going to be born. But that was prophesied 700 years before. And so the teachers of the law, uh, they got in there and they, they looked this up in the scriptures, saying, well, that's what the scriptures say. But isn't it odd, I believe, that, that we never hear another thing about the chief priest and the teachers of the law surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ. I mean, to me, this is really interesting. The teachers of the law and the priests have just heard that the Messiah has been born, so they look at, at the scriptures, which is a good thing. But in response, the ones who have dedicated their lives to God and the scriptures... The ones who make their living from teaching about God's law and his prophecies and about the Messiah, they do nothing. They don't investigate. They don't, they don't search him out. They just say, well, the scripture says, you know, over there in Bethlehem, he's probably over that way somewhere. You know, imagine and probably not many of you here would be a member of the fan club of Justin Bieber. But let's just imagine for a moment. I had to select a name. I, you know, I'm not up to date. Who, who would be even a more popular individual amongst at least the teens and young adults today? I don't know. A lot of them have gone over to the internet kind of thing. I know on YouTube and all that kind of stuff. And and uh, I know some of you are looking at one another and saying, tell him, tell him who it is. You know, you don't have to do that. But, but at any rate, you know, it's, uh, let's just use Justin Bieber. What if you were a part of his fan club in our town here of Shelbyville? You actually, you were the president of his fan club. And I know for some that may be too painful to consider, and I get that. But just try. Imagine that Justin sent you a personal email, being his 
president, you know, the fan club, and that he's going to do a free concert right here in Shelbyville at the best uh, bet event ever. And, and he wants to know where to stay. And so you just kind of nonchalantly send him back an email and you tell him, um, you know, as his biggest fan in the world, you respond and, and you say, well, just stay at the Shelby Inn. It's historic. You know, it's a nice place. And then you just kind of go back to work and, and get back to your business as usual and, and forget about it. Now, we all know that if the real president of the Justin Bieber fan club received that kind of email, I mean, she would be right where he is as soon as she could be. She, wouldn't, she would have at least a, a hundred of screaming friends with her, I'm sure. And there's gonna be crying and shaking and, and fainting. There won't be any ignoring. There will be no business as usual. But that's not the case here with the priest and the teachers of the law. They're waiting and teaching about the Messiah. The Israelites have been waiting for years for the coming of the Messiah. Every young woman, it was her desire to give birth to the Messiah. And when news comes that he's arrived, they give Herod the biblical answer, I'll oh, just head on over there to Bethlehem. But then they didn't do anything else about it. From what I can gather about the Pharisees, I think they were mostly excited about the fact that they were able to search and study and, and find the correct answer. But it seems like they didn't really care about the Messiah himself, the one they knew so much about. They didn't seem interested. They were more interested in what they knew about the Messiah than about the opportunity that they had to come and know and receive and to worship him. Just from our talk today, you know probably more about the Magi than 80% of the population. But don't let your knowledge and familiarity with the events of Christmas steal away the wonder of it all. Don't misunderstand me. It's important to learn about God. It's essential to study his word and his commands. But don't make the mistake that the teachers and the priests made where they put knowing about God above knowing God. They knew about him. I just don't believe they knew him. Jesus didn't say in John chapter 10, verse 14, I know my sheep and my sheep know about me. He didn't say that. He said, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And you see, as, as the more we do life together, the more we know. We can, we can know one another by the voice of the individual we hear and those that we're doing life with. We can know Jesus by his voice. And we are not a sheep without a shepherd. You know, God reveals himself through his word, but the whole point is to draw close to him in order to know him more and become more like him in his love. And as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Love builds up. God showed up on Christmas so that we can know him and have a relationship with him and not know simply about him. There's a difference. You see, let your life, your actions reflect your relationship with Christ. Walk the talk, as they used to say. You see, here's the thing. People don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. You can learn all about Jesus and not have a relationship with him. Don't let your knowledge steal the treasure of Christmas from your heart. Now, let's look at another response to the first Christmas and look at verse three, if you would, please. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all of Jerusalem with him. Now here we learn 
that when King Herod heard that the Magi had come to worship, the one who had been born king of the Jews, he was disturbed. Herod was paranoid. Why? Because he was power hungry. He was power hungry. History tells us that Herod was one cruel guy. He killed his own two sons. That's history. He was jealous of and threatened by their power. So he killed his two sons. He killed one of his wives for the same reason. You see, his response was that of fear. And history tells us he was so afraid of losing his throne, true to form, Herod pretended that he wanted to worship Jesus, but it was in pretense. But we see later in the chapter that his plan was really to kill the Messiah. Remember, he had all the children under two years of age killed. Why under two years of age? Well, we've talked about that a little bit. Jesus did grow up a little before heading over to Egypt. You know, Herod's response to Christmas is an extreme example of self-preservation and fighting for the status quo. How many people today fight for power? Many. Many. I don't see how some people can even celebrate the true meaning of Christmas, the way they act all year long, long, all year long, wrong, long. I'm not talking about you, though, because you all act good. But there's some places you don't want to go. You see, Herod's response to Christmas is an extreme example of that self-preservation. And in our passage, the first century account, uh, the wise men come and ask Herod if he knew anything about the new king. So the paranoid fear of Herod, it, it raised its ugly head. And Herod summoned the religious leaders and asked them if they knew anything about this new king. And they said, yes, the prophets say that he was born in Bethlehem. And so Herod summons the wise men and tells him of Bethlehem and tells him to let him know where the new king is. Why? So he can go and worship him. (laughs) You know, I think all of us have a little bit of Herod in us from time to time. But we need to put fear behind us and let our faith take hold of us and rejoice as we come to Jesus. You see, Herod's response was that of fear. But today, so many respond to Jesus with fear. You see it all the time. In other words, they say, if I crown him king of kings and lord of lords in my life, then I'm going to have to quit playing at being a Christian. I will have to really put him first in my life and I will have to let him change the way I think and the way I act. And I'm afraid to do that. My friends, we need to put fear behind us and let our faith take hold of us and rejoice as we come to the one true King Jesus. You know, Herod treats the news of Christmas in the same way he responds to any threats of his power. He tries to eliminate it. Are there any that try to eliminate Christmas today? Happy holidays. (laughs) He even fakes interest in worship so that he can maneuver for the upper hand. While few of us wouldn't actively fight against the Messiah, there is likely a little bit of Herod in each one of us to guard against. We just need to be aware. What about the part of us that takes from the glory of Jesus in this season by putting our traditions above our worship? You see, it's the part of us that elevates our expectations above the needs of others. 
Now, whenever we demand that things go our way in the holiday um, above what God might be doing or even the needs of others, we make a similar mistake, I believe, to the one King Herod made on that very first Christmas day. Now, traditions can be great. They can be. You know, we, we all practice tradition. It's good. You know, I remember going over the river and through the woods to Grandma's house all the time. <laughs> it was a great time. But we need to be open to God's leading. Who might you serve this season? You know, part of worship is allowing God to have his way even when it collides with our preferences or our expectations. Herod was so concerned with keeping control that he not only missed the greatest blessing in history, but he fought it directly. The meaning and the power of the event are lost and stolen for Herod and the Pharisees. Oh, but thank God for the Magi's. <laughs> thank God for the Magi's. Because their approach of worship is the proper response to what God did that night. It wasn't the only response. You remember the shepherds. You remember Mary, how she pondered things in her heart. You see, when we consider that night uh, the culmination of hundreds and even thousands of years of prophecy... When we consider that God went to these great lengths for you and me, when we remember that Jesus did indeed save us from our sins, what else can we do <laughs> but to worship him? I mean, if we follow the Magi's example, we'll find that the power and the wonder and the meaning of the holiday will not be wasted or stolen from us. And as we consider our preparation and response to the wonder of Christmas, let's consider the example of the Magi. Because when they saw the child with his mother, what did they do? They bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And that's a sermon all in itself. We know nothing else really about the Magi, but we do know that in light of what God had done, their response is the only one that makes sense. What should our praise and worship look like? I mean, especially this side of the cross and resurrection. They didn't even have that then. If you want to guard the meaning and the wonder of Christmas, I suggest that you start with worship. There's nothing that centers our hearts and minds on what really matters like worship. We don't worship God because he needs it. We worship God because we need it. We need that. The best worship of all is the worship that comes out of our obedience to scriptures like Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, because this is your true and proper worship. Giving him the praise he's due. And when we do, it reminds us of who he really is. Our worship fuels and feeds our gratitude. Our worship brings us back to the grandeur, the grace, and the greatness of Almighty God. And when we worship, we experience a deeper connection with God and fall deeper in love with Him. We can plainly see that the teachers of the law 
should have known better. They should have known better. They knew about God, but they didn't know him personally. We can easily tell that Herod chose the wrong thing. How ironic that as Herod tried to prop up his greatness, he chose the lesser thing. <laughs> his own power could never match the power of Almighty God. His own place and position could never compare with the presence of God. The Magi show us the way to make the most of Christmas through worship. And there are hundreds of passages in the Bible that have the word worship in them. I'm going to give you just very quickly a few uh, things that come directly out of, the, out of the Bible as to how we can worship. In the Bible, people worship by bowing, by lying face down, by lifting hands, by clapping, by serving, by making sacrifices, by trembling, by singing uh, joyfully, by thinking and giving, uh, kneeling, shouting, singing in gladness, confessing, exalting, dancing, and responding in spirit and in truth, to name a few. The Magi worship through their gifts and offerings. The shepherds worship through the proclaiming of the good news. The angels worship through song. Mary worshiped by pondering all the amazing events in her heart. And like the Magi, you can choose whatever form of worship that best fits the occasion. The Magi had precious metals and spices that they gave to God. They gave God what they had. And so, what are we going to give God this Christmas? What are we going to give God this Christmas? The beauty of worship is that it can be done in so many ways, through song, through prayer, through gathering and fellowship, with celebrating, even through service on you know, if, if you have kids whose eyes fill up with the delight on Christmas morning, I hope you see that as an opportunity to thank God and quietly worship him for giving you family. As you share meals, I hope you begin in gratitude for his provision. If you face disappointment and heartache, I hope you find a way to identify with the ultimate reason for Christmas, the cross of Jesus. And as you raise a toast or come to church, I pray that your head bows to the mighty creator and your hearts lift in joy because of all that he has done for you. I'd like to ask the praise team if they'd make their way forward you know, the Magi worshiped the king, and it was not because they were supposed to or because it, it was required, but because their hearts demanded that of them. They encountered the word, who became flesh, God with us, and they were never the same again. My friends, if we do anything this Christmas, Let's remember what God has done and give God his due. He is worthy of our worship. If you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. I wanna, want you please to consider doing that. What a, there's no better time than right here at Christmas time where God sent his son so that we can grow in a relationship with him. So if you're here today, you've never been baptized into him for the forgiveness of your sins, Raised to a newness of life, I invite you to come today as we stand and sing our invitation. Stand.